Bible study, Matthew chapter 15, if you'll turn there. Matthew chapter 15, if you're visiting Calvary Chapel, we go through the books of the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And we've gone as far as verse 21 of Matthew chapter 15. And we do read. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered in her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. Father, I do pray that as we look at this story recorded here for all eternity, that there is something here for us. Because I know that there are parents, there are those who are crying out to you even this morning. And as this one comes in real need, there's so much to learn from, to gain from, to be encouraged by. And Lord, we know that you will not be hidden. And you will cross borders to come into our lives because you care for us and you love us. And I pray that, again, our ears would be open to you and our hearts soft before you. As we read this story, these words jump out at us. And they touch our hearts. This woman touches our hearts. But we also know that you want to touch ours. So, Lord, we give you this time in the study of your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So if you've been with us going through Matthew, Jesus leaves the Galilee region. You recall that uh, as uh, he uh, was in the Galilee region, there is the religious leaders. After defeating the 5,000, which was near Passover, the people would travel to Jerusalem. The news is going all around Jerusalem of the incredible miracles that Jesus is performing. So some of those religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, uh, would go up to the Galilee region, and they're watching Jesus and his disciples. And we know that they began to mount their hostility against him once again. The, The hostility is going to be growing. The opposition is going to increase. And they were watching Jesus and the disciples And they commented, those religious elite, and they said that you and your disciples don't keep the traditions, the traditions of the elders, particularly when it comes to washing. So Jesus responded to them, and he said that you make your traditions, you make the word of God of no effect by your traditions. In other words, you don't keep the commandment of God. And he would go on in rebuking them, and he would say to them that they are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a pit. So Jesus now leaves that area of Galilee. He's leaving this, uh, the religious leaders coming and watching him. And he would travel about 50 miles to the north over mountains along the coast up to Tyre and Sidon. As we read this story, also recorded in Mark's gospel, Mark gives us some additional information. And as Jesus goes up to that area of Tyre and Sidon, he goes and enters into a house. Now, this is before there were verbos or B&Bs in those days. So someone opened up their home to Jesus and the disciples. But Mark also tells us something that he wanted no one to know it. No one to know that he'd entered into that house but that he could not be hidden. And I find that interesting, the contrast, because we read, for example, in John chapter 8, when Jesus was in Jerusalem for the feast, that the Pharisees wanted to stone him because of his claim of deity. He would say to them, before Abraham was, I am. And the Pharisees picked up stones to throw at him, to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, as John's gospel records, and went out of the temple going through the midst of them. Now, I don't know how that exactly happened, but I believe that Jesus can't hide himself if he truly wants to. He couldn't be hidden here as we read this story. Why? And I think it's because, as we're going to discover in this little vignette, that there was a Gentile woman, this Canaanite woman that came to him, that truly was seeking him and calls out to him. 
And for you here this morning, listen, that as you seek him and as you call out to him, he will not be hidden. This woman, as we are going to read, is coming in brokenness and in humility and in real need. And he couldn't be hidden. Sometimes we think in, in when we come to the Lord in our hopelessness or in our despair, when we're broken, that God is hidden. And we can learn from the story that he will reveal himself and he will reveal to the heart who really desires to seek him very wonderful truths that we're going to see here in the story this morning. And this woman, she comes to Jesus. He, he couldn't be hidden because she has a great need. And she cries out to him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. This Canaanite woman, her heart is crying out. And God's word presents her to us this morning and holds her in front of us. Because there are some things that he wants you and I to see and to understand about her. Because those things touch our own lives. No, he doesn't hide himself from a genuine need. He doesn't hide himself from one who has a genuine cry. She is of Canaan. She's not of the house of Israel. She is a picture of you and I, millions that will be brought into the kingdom of God. For you and I this morning, <clears throat> she comes and she is a mom. She is a parent, and she has a daughter. Mark tells us that she has a young daughter. And this woman of Canaan, Mark tells us she is of, uh, was Syrophoenician by birth. Uh, she is from that area, that Jezebel uh, of the Old Testament. You read about her in particularly Second Kings. She brought with her the pagan worship of Baal and Astar into the land of Israel when she came. And she married uh, Ahab, the king of Israel, of, of the ten northern tribes. We know that Tyre and Sidon was violent in their religious practice, very immoral. But more than anything, this woman identifies as a mom. And she comes to Jesus and says, my daughter, my young daughter is severely demon possessed. Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. What happened? How did it happen? Did her daughter get involved in some kind of dark practice and dark beliefs? We don't know. What we can know is that this mom is crying out to Jesus concerning her daughter. No doubt, she is drained. How worn out and exhausted is she? What does she live with day after day? What does she live with hour after hour? What does she live with night after night with a demon-possessed daughter? The torment. Seeing her daughter in such darkness and in bondage and the overwhelming feeling of hopelessness and despair. How did this happen? We don't know. But this is her little girl. Watching over time, her daughter, her countenance changed. Her language changed. The tone of her voice changed. The look in her eyes, her personality, it darkened until she looked at her daughter and she knew that her daughter was gone. She looked into the eyes of her young daughter and knew something was very dark. And any of us who are parents, we can put ourselves in the sandals of this mom in her situation. This story leaps out at us. And I know that there have been parents and others that have gone through the services this morning. And you have the pleas to the Lord praying. You're saying, my daughter, my son, my grandchild they're so young. But there's darkness. It's gotten so dark for them. They're depressed. They're in despair. They feel hopeless. They run away. They're suicidal. 
And they are in a dark place. It's like I don't know them anymore. And something is so wrong. And is the mom feeling guilty? Did I allow? Did I introduce? Did I not pay attention? This is my fault. I failed in this area. I dropped the ball. I should have stopped that. I wish we could go back and I would do it differently. And there are parents in this place this morning that you have a child that is a prodigal. They're out there in the world. They're in a dark place. And you have spent so much time second-guessing yourself. What if I have done this? What if I've done that differently? Oh, I wish I would have come to the Lord sooner when I was raising them. We should have now never allowed them to do that or to go there. I looked away. I ignored things and, and, and problems way too often. I was so caught up with work and I didn't take the time I should have or could have for them and with them. But over the years, over time, you notice their behavior changes. Their attitude changes. It starts to get bad. It begins to trouble you. And you become very fearful for them. And you don't sleep and you agonize. And you say in your heart, what do I do? What do I do? And many of you, you can understand to some degree this woman before us this morning. And now she finds out that Jesus is here in Tyre and Sidon. No doubt she has heard the stories that he's the one that heals people of every sickness and disease. And he's the one that frees those who are demonized. And this one has crossed borders that she thought he would never cross. And he is in my country now. And he is in my neighborhood. And this is one place in the Gospels that he specifically crosses into Gentile territories. Next week, we are going to see that he will go from here to the Decapolis. Decapolis was an area that had both Jews and Gentiles. But this is straight up Gentile territory. And when the Jews ever found themselves in this area, they would come home, and before they crossed the border back into Israel, they would shake the dust off their feet so they would not pollute Israel with Gentile dust. That was their mindset. He's there. He wouldn't be hidden. And she cries out to him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Jesus longed to hear that in Israel, but he didn't hear it. Son of David, a messianic term. Is she owning him as Messiah? The religious leaders would say that she had no right to say that because she is a Gentile. Where did she learn that from, that term, son of David? Could it be that a thousand years previously, that Hiram, the king of Tyre and Sidon, he was a friend of David? He was close to David. He provided all the cedar logs for the temple, and David made a covenant with him, and so did Solomon, who was the one that actually built the temple. And what they did is they had 30,000 men, as you read 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, that were in shifts, and they would help cut the cedar logs, so cedar forests up in Lebanon. And they would ship the logs down the coast of, of Israel in the Mediterranean Sea, and they would bring it to Joppa, and then from Joppa bring those cedar logs up to Jerusalem. And so David witnessed to Hiram. And he knew about David's God. And could it be that she is thinking, here is the son of David. Maybe this is their Messiah, and I can cry out, son of David. We don't know exactly what it is that she's thinking using that term. But it seems clear to me that she comes believing. Jesus had offered everything to Israel, and they didn't believe. Here he offers nothing to her, and she believes. As we read again in verse 23, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. 
So you got to love these guys, these disciples. Remember in the previous chapter, the multitude of the 5,000, that it was getting late. Uh, they're getting hungry. Uh, their response to the multitude was, send them away. Send them away into town. And now they say to Jesus, send her away. That's their answer to ministry to those who are in need. The send them away guys. Now to be fair to the text, we don't know if the disciples are saying, send her away, she's bugging us, get rid of her. Or will you just give her what she's asking for? Just heal her daughter. That seems to be what the text is telling us. They urged him, you know, bring this healing so we can send her away because she cries out after us. But I want us to notice something as we read in verse 23. He answered. Matter of fact, as we read the rest of this story, we're going to see that Jesus answered four times. In verse 23, in verse 24, in verse 26, and then finally in verse 28. But in verse 23, once again, he answered. Notice, not a word. Nothing. Have you ever felt that way? She is crying out to him, and he answers not a word. Is Jesus giving her the silent treatment? Is he ignoring her? Is he being rude to her? Is Jesus being silent to me? Is he ignoring me in my cries? And as we read this vignette, we can think, Man, the disciples and Jesus, they sure are testy here. I mean, I know they had a long trip. They crossed over mountains. Some of that area they crossed over, you would think that you're in Colorado. And here the disciples send her away. She cries out after her. He answers her not a word. Is he calling her a dog that we're going to read in verse 26? But we know that is not the heart of our Lord, is it? And there is a wonderful story unfolding before us. But I know that there have been times in my life, and some of you can say the same thing, that you felt this way, that, Lord, you're silent, and I'm not hearing anything. Lord, has your love left? Has your love failed? Lord, are you angry at me? Do you disapprove? We begin to have these thoughts that, that, that go through our minds, that stay in our hearts. And listen, we are going to see that his silence is not his disapproval. But he is going to let this develop to where her faith is going to be revealed because he is going to speak to her and answer her. And I know that perhaps there are some that are here even at this service. There certainly have been those have been through the two previous services because they told me that they have felt this way at times. They cried out to the Lord. Maybe you're crying out to the Lord. And maybe you're crying over a child. Maybe you're crying over a situation. Maybe it's a problem. And you think, Lord, I don't hear you. And I'm waiting. And I'm waiting on you. And Lord, it's so difficult. And you think, Lord, why are you hiding from me? You see, David felt that way in Psalm 13. And as you read that psalm, he begins by saying, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? Have you ever felt that way? David did. But he ends the psalm by saying, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And we're going to see at the end of this story that he is going to deal bountifully with her. But certainly many of us, if not most of us, we have been there. Some of you are there right now. Lord, have you forgotten about me? Are you hiding your face from me? How long am I going to have to take counsel in my soul? There is sorrow and pain in my heart day after day. You're there now. 
And so the story continues as he gives a second answer. After the disciples, as we read this, say, send her away. Jesus answered in verse 24. Remember, he's talking to the disciples. He answered her not a word. Send her away. She calls out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It didn't matter that he didn't directly say this to her. But she hears all of this. And she absolutely amazes me. She amazes me. And she also teaches me something. She persists in her faith in his silence. She persists in her faith knowing she's not of the house of Israel but a Gentile. She persists in her faith when she hears the disciples say, send her away. And I want to say this. Never turn away from your faith Never turn away from Jesus because of other Christians. Don't turn away from following the Lord because a Christian did or said something that upset you, hurt you, came against you. And I know that there are some of you here that you've experienced that. That you've gone through a Christian that said something that upset you, did something that hurt you, and the hurt is real. And the pain is there. And I don't want to dismiss that, but it will happen. People in churches will let you down. And they will disappoint you. And unfortunately, they will even bring hurt to you, but not Jesus. Don't let Christians turn you away from Jesus. She's crying after us. What do you mean after us? Send her away, guys. She was crying after the Lord. I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And at this point, I think if I was this woman, I would have left at this point. I would have left. In the honest day of my heart, as I think about this, I would have left in despair and in defeat and discouraged. She had nothing going for her. Her race is against her. Her gender would be against her. Because it was a time where women would be held in low esteem by most rabbis. The disciples are against her. It even seems, as we read this, that Jesus is against her. Was Jesus being difficult to her? But as we are going to see that he is going to be drawing out from her an understanding from her that would not only be helpful for her specifically, but through the ages as others have read this, helpful to them historically, helpful to you and to me as we read this presently. She is completely broken. Her pain is real. And it seems like she is out of options. She is out of options except for one. Except for one. In verse 25, and she came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. Three words, Lord, help me. She is broken. She is hurting. So much so that she isn't even trying son of David. It is... Lord, help me. And she worshiped him. And that is where the Lord wants us to be. You see, as long as I have options, as long as I have a plan, as long as I have uh, alternatives, I will go that route. But when we find our faith to be purified, when we reach that place of brokenness and our cry is sincere and the focus of that cry is Jesus... When we come to the place where we are so weary and so heavy laden and we have no options and all we can say is three words, Lord, help me. Help me. My young daughter. And to remember that it was he who said earlier on that hillside in Galilee, Come to me, all of you who weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lord, help me. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. 
I look in her eyes and I don't know who's there. Her personality is gone. The little girl that I raised is no longer there. Lord, help me. And some of you are in that place this morning. Jesus had just taught his disciples on what matters is in your heart. And as we read in verse 26, he answered, this is the third time he said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now Mark records, Jesus said, let the children be filled first. I like that. Let the children be filled first. There's hope in that. Now, is Jesus being harsh, calling her a dog? The Gentiles were referred to as dogs by some of the Jews, particularly the religious elite, the Pharisees. He is not, listen, calling her a dog the way a Pharisee would have addressed a Gentile. The Greek word here for dog means a little puppy dog, a pet, not the wild dogs that ran the streets. And the little children, of course, is a reference to the children of Israel. Now, in raising four kids when they were young, we had a Sheltie all during the time that we had the four kids. And at dinner time, we always ate dinner together, but that Sheltie lived under the table because she knew she'd get a free meal. I was telling Sue, why do we buy dog food? Because the kids, you know, always dropping stuff on the floor, and she ate it up. It didn't matter what it was, a piece of meat, or if it was broccoli, she ate it up. So, But that's the way it always was. And it's like, Belle, get out from under my feet. I used to say that all the time. Send her outside, put her outside, and the kids go, oh, Dad, but it's so cold out there. Don't be so mean. For 15 years, she was under that table. <laughs> Jesus is not insulting her. He's not being difficult with her. But he is drawing out from her a growing response of faith, and she is absolutely remarkable. As she seized on that illustration and said in verse 27, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. I know that you have come to the house of Israel. I know that bread shouldn't be given to the little dogs, but I do know that they get the crumbs that come from the master's table. Lord, help me. Jesus wasn't being harsh to her. He was helping her. He wasn't being difficult, but drawing from her that faith which Jesus now says as we finish the story, O oh woman, it was a term of respect. Great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Two people, two people Jesus noted for having great faith. One was, as many of you know, the Roman centurion in chapter 8 that came and said, just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And this woman, both are Gentiles. He never said that to one of the Jews. He never said that to one of his disciples. Matter of fact, he said to his disciples, oh, you have little faith. And this woman goes home and finding that the demon was gone, looking at her little girl, I got her back. There's light in her eyes. I've got her back. She's been delivered. And I always wonder, because when you go to the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 21, Paul's making his way after his third missionary journey to Jerusalem. And it says, a couple of verses there, how he stopped in Tyre and Sidon, and there were some disciples there, and he stayed there for three days. And then as he's getting on a boat there, to go and finish his journey, to go to Joppa and then up to Jerusalem, that we see that it was the women and the children that met with him out there on the beach, and they had a prayer meeting. They prayed together, said goodbye to Paul the Apostle. And I think, could it be, could it be that this woman and this daughter was in that group? They were on that beach. And I want you to know this that Jesus cares for your kids. He cares for families. And as we read this, I want you to know that this woman shows us that if you're here today and you are hurting and there's a hole in your heart and your heart is broken and you're in need, 
You can put aside the religious jargons and formulas and all of that and just let your cry be genuine. And if all you can get out is, Lord, help me, even in that, Romans chapter 8 says he takes our groanings and our mourning, uh, moanings, the Holy Spirit, and he translates them into words. He intercedes for us. Because sometimes we hurt so much we don't even express words to be able to give to the Lord, but the Holy Spirit will. And this woman would say to us, if God remains silent, he is not refusing. You wait because he is merciful. And his word promises to you and to me that he will bless those who wait on him. Isaiah chapter 30. His word promises he'll be good to those who wait on him. Lamentations chapter 3. His word declares that he will renew our strength as we wait on him. Isaiah chapter 40. And as we wait on him, we are told that he will give a word to us. And on this side of the cross, we are now his children. We have the spirit of adoption where we can cry out, Abba, Father. And we sit at his table. And don't let others turn you away. They may get tired of your cries. They may want you to go away. But not him. Don't follow them. You follow him. Don't follow them. You follow him. And you will find that he is so compassionate, so long-suffering, and great is his faithfulness. And he will cross whatever borders he needs to cross to come into your life. And you will not be refused. And when you come in your pain, and you come in your brokenness, and you come with a genuine cry, you will not be refused. And he will not be hidden. So, Father, we thank you for this story. Showing us the tender love that you have for us and our children, our families, those that we love. And I know that there are those here this morning that they have that cry. Maybe they think that They've you hidden yourself from them. You haven't. Or you disapprove because they're waiting on you. But Lord, that you would draw out from us just a response of faith because you have dealt bountifully with us. You've saved us. You've forgiven us. But Lord, we know that the world is dark out there. And we know that there are those that we love and care for that are in a dark place. And we ask that you would bring light to them, even right now. As people are, are thinking of their loved ones, a child, a grandchild, someone else, they're so far from you. It seems hopeless, but there's always hope with you. And we cry out, help me, Lord. Help them to find their way home, to come home, to come to you, to bring light in the darkness, to open their ears spiritually, to take the blindness off, to free them from the bondage that they're in, the bondage of the world or Whatever's going on in their lives, you see and you know. And Lord, when we feel like, how long, Lord? How long? That we know that you are with us every moment of the day and in the night watches when we can't sleep. That we will perceive your presence and your comfort. So, Lord, we lift up those who are in the darkness and in bondage to the world, to the schemes of the enemy, that you would free them, that 
you would work in their lives. There would be a spiritual awakening. A life brought to them. Father, I thank you that we can go out of this place being encouraged by this story. Given to us. I do pray if there's anyone here that you've never given your life to Jesus for salvation and forgiveness. That he is everything that you need. He provided forgiveness of sin to bring you into right relationship with the Father. The hope of eternal life, it only comes through Jesus. What he did on the cross and rising from the grave is not found in the world. It's not found in, in you. It's found in him. And all you have to do is call out to him. To say, Lord, save me. Forgive me. Because from that cross, he did the work. And made atonement for your sins and rose again. And he proved he's the son of God. Will you come to him? Today is the day of salvation. Don't leave this place. Don't turn off the, the computer or the radio if you've never made a decision for him, for salvation. It's the greatest need that you have. And he's the only one that can meet that need. He did it, the work on the cross, because of his love for you. And he says, come. You can come right now. You can pray, Jesus, I come to you, and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me, and I believe the words that you cried out, it is finished. So I thank you. Forgive me. And you rose again in your life, and I ask that you sit upon the throne of my life as my personal Lord and Savior. And I thank you for this new beginning. I want to walk with you and know you all the days of my life. Keep me close to you, Lord, in this new beginning, in Jesus' name. And for all of us as I leave this place, Lord, may we persist in our prayers and our faith to you, Lord. And Lord, may we never turn away from you. So Father, thank you for today and this morning. Bless everyone here as we go our way. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. God is good, isn't he?